I am Vinny Tonerich, folks. Your good intentions have been stolen. But don't worry. I'm here to help you get them back. You may be soft and succulent at the beginning of this process, but hang in there. Before long, you will be lean and mean, guaranteed, just like the woman on the other mic. She's been on this Friday show several times. God, I, I was living back in Los Angeles the first time she came on. And then uh, we were living in, in the first house during COVID. When she came on, I was living in, I was, I was literally recording right in my little breezeway. I remember the last time she came on. This is maybe the third or fourth, maybe the fourth time she's been on. I'm talking about my favorite woman, woman <laughs> from Cambridge, <laughs> Zoe Harcom. How are you doing, Zoe? Great. Thank you very much for having me back. I did get to college right, Cambridge, right? And you yeah, like when it's Cam something, Cambridge is something. the university, and then it yeah. has lots of little colleges. So I went to Corpus Christi College, Cambridge University. And weren't you the first muckety muck of something that went to Cambridge from somewhere? What, what, what was that distinction? I, um, I know I'm not just making this up. No, yeah, no, no, you're not actually. So I went to what's called a state, I think you'd call it a state school. So in the UK, we have private schools where you pay money to go there and you have state schools, which the government provide for you. And obviously the private ones are better. And I went to a state school and I was the first pupil from my state school to graduate from Cambridge in, I don't know, a hundred years. They'd never had anyone. And I, I think the school was a hundred years old. So um, they have a little plaque of me apparently up in reception, which is hilarious. Yeah, you know, I just remember that there was something impressive about you in Cambridge. So uh, good on you. One of the things I remember, you know, I, I remember goofy things, right? And um, I remember us talking about a quote that you saw somewhere. And the quote was, people would rather be blind, deaf, mm -hmm. and lose a limb rather than be obese. Did I get that right? You did, God, oh, you're taking me back here. I think um, I opened my obesity book um, talking about that. So from memory, you're stretching me here. That book was written in 2009. I think that's a Colleen Rand study from the University of Florida. And it was looking at people who had been morbidly obese and they then had bariatric surgery and they'd managed to achieve a not normal weight because you never do, but they weren't morbidly obese anymore. They'd lost a lot of weight, like some of them had lost 200 pounds. And then they did a qualitative survey where they said to them, would you rather A or B? Would you rather be blind or would you rather go back to your previous weight? Would you rather be deaf? Would you rather go back to your previous weight? And basically they would rather every affliction you could give them rather than go back to their previous weight. And I thought that was such a brilliant, simple study to tell us just how awful it is to, to be the victim of the fake food industry and the um the, the people it produces yeah, it was a very powerful study yeah you know by the way um, as you may know I don't, you may not know this i have a photographic memory for things i read and i knew that was associated with you in some way shape or form and it it always whenever i hear that you know i talk to people on a daily basis i do these consults and people think I'm doing them for them, but I'm actually doing them for me because it gets me in front of real people who are going through the real situation. Mm -hmm. And so many of them have had bariatric surgery, either the sleeve or the phobe pouch or the, the balloon, you name it. They, they've somehow had one of their organs just chopped completely out in order to try to lose weight. And the reason they're talking to me is because yeah, they might have lost 200, 250, 300 pounds, and then miraculously put it back on. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a guy we talk about on my show all the time. His name is Scott King. Um, as a matter of fact, Scott just did a little video yesterday, and it brought me to tears. And this guy is not a big videographer or anything. He's just a, a dude in Texas with a family. And his story is just so amazing because he – had his stomach cut out and he lost 300 pounds wow. and then magically put the 300 back on and went past that. He went beyond what a scale can weigh him. He was close to 600 pounds, if not more. Wow. And one day his young daughter was running towards the highway 
and Scott couldn't get out of a chair. He couldn't save his own kid's life. Luckily, there were no cars coming, and someone got to the kid. Maybe Scott finally got there. Who knows? I can't remember the story. But he looked around when he grabbed his kid and said, I can't protect my family. Mm -hmm. Think about that. Think about that statement. Can't protect my family. And um, lo and behold, he heard me on Dr. Drew's podcast, Adam Carolla and Dr. Drew's podcast, and literally thought to himself, everything else has failed me. Okay, I'll probably die anyway. I'll just start eating bacon. I'll just start eating red meat. Right? And started losing weight, and feeling good and getting energy, and on and on and on. Right? Yet we have we have a society now, not a society, we have a world where people like Walter Willett <laughs> are coming out saying, hey, if you even look at meat, you're going to get type 2 diabetes, which is it's crazy. Now, look, and I want you to comment on that, Zoe. A few years ago, whenever I saw... Um, Michael Greger, I don't put the doctor distinction in front of him because he's not a doctor. He's not an MD. Okay. Did, did you know that? Did no, you know I that? didn't actually. I, I call him one of the vegan high priests. So that's what I refer to him as. Yeah, he, um, well, I guess he's a doctor in a sense that you're a doctor. You have a PhD, so you're Dr. Zoe Harcomb. Um, He has a basically a PhD, but he doesn't have an MD. He can't, okay. he can't operate. He can't practice because he's not an MD. Most people don't know that. I didn't know that. Yeah, but but you see, he wears the white coat and the stethoscope around his neck, which the, the connotation is, I'm a doctor. Mm. But he's not. He's not an MD. He's a, at best a PhD, which, okay, that's something. But here's the deal. He was saying 10 years ago that eating even one egg a week will cause type 2 diabetes. These are bold-faced lies. Now, when one idiot, I'm sorry, I don't mean to call him an idiot, when one charlatan like uh, Michael Greger says that, you go, okay, he's just a charlatan. He's an, you know, he, he knows it's not true. He's selling BS. But when a major study comes out that says eating meat twice a week will cause type 2 diabetes, or can cause, I can't remember the wording now. What say you? I mean, it, it's nonsense. You, you know it's nonsense because it just makes zero sense. Um, I also know it's nonsense because what I do is I look at studies and I take them apart. And I've been putting out a note on that every Monday and I'm up to number 660. So I have taken apart 660 articles and quite often you have to take apart another article to understand the current one. So you go into the references and there's something else you need to look at. So this, the first starting point is what is diabetes? We're talking about type two diabetes here. So type two diabetes is essentially the inability to um, process glucose, to metabolize glucose, to handle glucose. Your body has got to the point where it said you consume too much glucose too often, Every time you consume it, you're trying to get me to wake up the pancreas, release insulin, take the glucose out of the bloodstream. I just got to the point, I can't do that anymore. Enough is enough. I'm, I'm out. Um, and that to me is what type 2 diabetes is. So it's a condition of glucose. So you pick one of a couple of foods on the planet that contain no glucose whatsoever. Um, you know, if you put sugar in bacon, then it's the sugar that's the problem, not the bacon. And you're trying to tell us that that's going to give us type two diabetes. I mean, it's so obviously wrong right from the outset. Um, you almost don't know where to start when, when you do a study like this. And, and that was my first reaction. And then I always think of a quotation by a surgeon, Captain Peter Cleave. And I closed the note with this um, caption where he said for a old fashioned food, which would be meat to be responsible for a modern illness, which would be type two diabetes is quite the most absurd thing I ever heard in my life. So we've been eating meat for as long as we were able to walk upright and catch things that were running around us. And then apparently that's responsible for type two diabetes, which is something that's exploded into our 
universe in, in the last few decades, it makes no sense on any level before you even start trying to do a good dissection on it. But the, as I've always said, my great grandmother, who barely spoke English, knew that if you ate bread, you got fat. <laughs> right. And I, you know, uh, my other grandmother with, I think, a sixth grade education, because they, they grew up during the Great Depression, they couldn't go to school, they had to work. My my other grandmother would say, don't eat sugar, you're going to get diabetes. Mm -hmm. These are things I heard back in 1972, 73. If 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 I was drinking a soft drink, don't drink that. You're going to rot your teeth and get diabetes. Mm -hmm. How is it my grandmother with a sixth grade education understood that? How did my great grandmother from Calabria understand that if you eat too much bread, you're going to get fat? Yet somehow here we are in 2023. And what those women were talking about with no education back then is now this is how you stay healthy, this is how you lose weight, and we can see the results. So your grandparents weren't conflicted, is, is the simple response to me. So the people that I see putting out this nonsense, particularly Harvard, I mean, I'd say of all the papers that I've looked at over the years, the team that I most commonly see are the Harvard Public School of Health, and it's become the Harvard T. Chan public school or school of public health, whichever the way words go. And T. Chan put in about $350 million worth of funding a few years ago, and that gets you your name on the public health building. And I call them the epidemiological paper production factory because almost every month, if not every week, they are churning out these population studies where they torture the same population data. So they take the nurses health study, um, and there's a version one and there's a version two, and then they that's just women. And then they take the health professionals follow-up study, which is the kind of equivalent for men. So again, it's got confounders of looking at health professionals, but that's classic population data. So those people were recruited back in the 1980s or 1990s. They record a ton of information on them. Um, what's their BMI? How much do they exercise? Do they smoke? Family history of this. And then they get them to fill in a food frequency questionnaire, which is your immediate inaccuracy for any population studies. And then they follow them over the next 20 to 30 years and they look for patterns. And I would guarantee that right now, Harvard don't even have to put in the graph to find the patterns. They've got some AI computer program just interrogating the data and they'll say, find me any pattern, uh, but don't find me a pattern between grains and type two diabetes. We don't want that. We want um, meat and type 2 diabetes, eggs and type 2 diabetes, we'll just ignore fish because that's a bit confusing to them. And if we can find anything that says whole grains are great, fruit is great, legumes are great, vegetables are great, all the stuff that they've already decided. That's not research. If you know what you're going to find before you go into something, you're not doing research, you're, you're biased. And those guys, I mean, Nina Teicholz has just put out an amazing investigative journalistic piece of outstandingness um, looking at Walter Willett and his conflicts and explaining why he has led this tirade against me for the past few decades. Yeah, I'll be talking to Nina later today. And that that show, folks, will be coming out next Friday. Pay attention to the Friday podcast from now through probably Christmas, because I have a, a rogues gallery of people coming on to talk about this one study, because this is very damaging. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, if I remember right, again, we're going back to what I read. Because as soon as I saw this headline, I went, it it reeks of Harvard, right? Before I saw, yeah, all I saw was a headline on Instagram. I went, this reeks of Harvard. I did a quick look. I realized it was the nurse's study. Um, you already probably know this. They took 216,000 people. 216,000 people over a 32-year period. And they gave them... Um, a questionnaire to fill out once every two or once every four years. Okay. Mm -hmm. You could tell I'm not reading any of this. I'm looking at you right in, in the camera, right? This is something I remember from a few weeks ago. Okay. If I said to you, Zoe, I'm going to say it to you. Zoe, what did you eat last Tuesday? Exactly. I have no idea. Where was what did I you even... eat breakfast two days ago? 
breakfast I'd be more sure of because I tend to have the same thing each day but last Tuesday I honestly don't know what I had in my diary so it was Halloween what did, what did you eat for dinner you see what did you eat for dinner five days ago no idea when was the last time you ate in a restaurant give me the date right now oh I can't I okay can't. so if I asked you what you ate four four years ago yeah no chance I mean, you're one of the smartest human beings I know, and you can't tell me other than breakfast <laughs> because it's identical every day. You can't tell me what you had a week ago. No. No. And most people, when I ask them what you had last night for dinner, before they answer, I get, uh. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's see, last night. Mm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's what you get before you get an answer. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. So... And I want you to speak to this. This is my feeling. You might be, you might feel completely different. I always feel in these surveys, people don't tell you what they actually ate. Yeah. They tell you what they want to eat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Agree? So, so, yeah. So I looked at, I, I found the nurse's health study. I found the one from 1980. Uh, it was mentioned in the paper as being a 61 item food frequency questionnaire where people were asked what they ate last year which is, is often the way, I mean, you might think, oh, that's ridiculous, but that is the most common food frequency questionnaire survey. So I had a really good research day. I happened to find this original PDF. I counted the number of items. There were 61. I thought, bingo, I have found their original study. And it had things like, um, how many times did you have two pieces of bacon? Well, how big is a piece of bacon? Um, if it's a, a streaky bacon, it's a sort of thin rasher. If it's a piece of back bacon, it's almost like a gammon steak. Then it said, how many times did you have six to eight ounces of chicken with the skin on? How many times did you have six to eight ounces of chicken without the skin on? And then I was thinking, OK, so imagine you're a nurse and you just happen to like chicken. And so you had it every night, but you only ever had four or five ounces. So how do you answer that question? Do you say, well, actually, I never have six to eight ounces of chicken because you don't you never have a six to eight ounce chicken portion or do you say okay but what I think they mean is over the week if I have five ounces for seven days that's 35 ounces so that's kind of five equivalents of the six to eight ounce that they're asking me for and then do you put that down I bet you don't I bet you don't I bet you have no idea how to answer that now we know that they didn't answer correctly because one of I, I pulled out 14 points on this one and some points are common to every epidemiological study and we can go into what they are and some were unique to this because this uh, this had some things that I wasn't expecting flaws that even I even I haven't seen before and the calorie intake when they put them they always put them into groups with the lowest intake of what they're looking at in this case red meat and then the highest intake and in this, what we call the characteristics table, which is always table one in one of these papers, they have the calorie intake of those groups. So you can see the average calorie intake of those in the lowest intake of meat group, and then the average calorie intake in the top group. So the average calorie intake, allegedly, of these nurses who were eating the least meat was 1,200 calories a day back in 1980. And these are women, before we had low calorie dieting, before we had diet foods, these are women on their feet all day, being wonderful human beings and saving people who need help. And then in the men, it was something like 680, six, yeah, 1684 calories in the lowest group. So you know they lied. You know they didn't remember right. what they ate. You know, they. some of them might be thinking, oh, you know, surely you just mean what I eat at meal times. You don't mean what I eat at three o'clock in the morning when I'm at the nurse's station, or you don't mean the box of chocolates that the wife bought me because I looked after her husband so well. Um, you just know it's completely inaccurate. And it is the foundation of this whole study. So if that is completely inaccurate, notwithstanding the fact there were 13 other major, major flaws, you just know that it's BS to start with. You know, one of the things I get with my people that I talk to on a daily basis now, you got to understand, these people are not calling me to impress me. They're calling me because they have a problem, right? They think they're doing low carb. They think they're doing NSNG to the T. Yet, after they lost, and they know it works because they've lost 50, 60, 80, 100 pounds. But they may still have 
60, 80, or 100 more pounds to lose. So they're stuck and they can't figure out what's going on. And when I take them through their diet, tell me what you have on a daily basis. And I don't let them tell me, well, I have a protein in the morning and I have, no, no, I don't want to know a protein. I want to know the actual food and the quantity, mm -hmm. right? And when I take them through that, and I'll say, Zoe, I'll, I'll say to people, I want you to say, I wake up and. Mm -hmm. And if you wake up and you go to the bathroom, that's what I want you to say. Mm -hmm. And then I drink a glass of water and then I pour a coffee. What's mm -hmm. in the coffee? I want to know everything. I get, I get granular with these people. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, it's like I'm there with one of those, um, you know, lice teasing combs. Right. <laughs> Just trying to tease out everything. I'll get to the end and their diet seems more perfect than mine. Right. So it doesn't make sense that they're not still losing weight. And I'll ask them about their blood work. And usually the triglycerides are way north of 100, sometimes closer to 200, which means they're not trying to lie to me. They just don't. We we have this thing in our brain, but we forget, oh, wait, I have the mixed nuts mid-morning because they're right there on the counter at work. And Susie always has a candy tray next to her thing and I always grab a candy. And at three o'clock, well, you know, we have coffee and at work and, and oh, yeah, we have a, you know, when you start getting into it, there are other things there. Because your triglycerides don't hit 120, 130 a day unless there's something else there. Yeah. Right. And that's where you have to get with these people. And there's no way that these nurses, hell, I've seen nurses. I've been in hospitals a lot because I've been operated on a lot. There's constant food. And when I talk to nurses, they're telling me there's constant food mm -hmm. hanging around. Yeah. And just because you walk past it and grab a handful and put it in your mouth, your liver is still keeping score. Mm -hmm. You're not keeping score, but your liver is. What say you? 100%. I absolutely agree. I mean, I've worked with people trying to help them to lose weight for a um, couple of decades now. And you work with somebody one-on-one -on -one where you want an absolute accurate food diary. If something goes in your mouth, even if it's a toothbrush with some toothpaste on, I want you writing it down. And there's one of two things happen. You either look at the diary and they've been honest with the diary and you can see why they haven't lost weight for the past few weeks, or they report back to you and go, oh my goodness, it's unbelievable. I've lost five pounds this week. And it's like, because the discipline of having to write it down stopped you putting the child's leftovers from the plate into your mouth because you didn't want to waste the food. And then we can have a conversation about what is it going on with you and not wanting to waste food because it should be in your child's tummy by now. So it's not wasted food. It's just, you know, it should have been gone. It doesn't mean you have to finish it off. So we have a different conversation then, but 100% what you just said there, I experience as well. You know, I've actually, and I don't want to get too far in the weeds in this because I want to get back to Walter Willett, but <laughs> we got to finish this branch before we go back to the trunk of the tree. I'll have parents doing a the consult. They'll say, yeah, you know, I gain weight because I'm eating my kids French fries or their chicken nuggets, Right. And then I'll say to him, why do you hate your kid? Yeah. You know, and boy, that, that really sobers up a parent really fast. Mm -hmm. I don't hate my kid. Well, you're not eating that stuff. I've taught you not to eat it. Mm -hmm. Why are you feeding it to your kid? Mm -hmm. Right? And that's a sobering thought. Mm -hmm. Well, they like it. And then I'll say to him, they wouldn't even know it existed. Yeah, but for you. If, if you never rolled into a McDonald's or a yeah. Taco Bell, they would yeah. not know it exists. Yeah. Right? So yeah. they like staying up at night as well, don't they? But you don't let them stay up at night because you know they'll feel like rubbish in the next morning. So right. they probably like cocaine if you gave it to them, but it's really not a good idea. Absolutely. And, and look, I used to have this conversation more so when I was back in LA because every parent wanted to get their kid in the right school, because mm -hmm. every parent thinks their kid's a, a genius here. And um, I would say to him, where are you feeding him for breakfast? I don't know, cereal, breakfast cereal. I thought you wanted your kid to be smart. Mm -hmm. Your kid is falling asleep at 10 in the morning. How do you know what my kid is doing? Because this is what I do for a living. You mm -hmm. can't spike your kid at seven in the morning and and expect that kid to be awake at 10 in the morning. Yeah. 
You just can't expect that. It's never going to happen. It will never work, right? But that's what these parents do. They want to get them in the right school, and they don't mind paying $80,000 a year getting them in the right school, but they won't put an egg and bacon in their kid's mouth because they don't think that's right. But it's not really their fault. It's Walter Willard's fault. And by the way, I don't know if you know this. I don't know if you saw Did you see my third documentary um, that I put out called Beyond Impossible? I'm sorry, I didn't. Oh, don't, don't apologize to me. Um, Beyond Impossible came out la this year, beginning of this year. And basically, it all came about because I own a food company, personally. And I was at the world's biggest food expo right, where all of the health foods come in and all the new foods, all the new healthy foods are coming in for the next year. I'm at this expo in Los Angeles. And everything, every booth around my booth was the term reimagined. Chicken reimagined. Ice cream reimagined. Fish, and I'm not making that up, reimagined. <laughs> And I would go around to these booths and, hey, can I can I see your product? They would offer me a taste. And it's like, no, no, I don't want to have it. I just ate some at the other. I'm, I'm a little full, you know, would, because I'm not eating soy crap, right? Yeah, yeah. But I would ask to see their ingredients. They all had a one sheet. Can I see the ingredients? Can I see? Everything was, was seed oils made, you know, just molded from soybeans and so many different expellers in there that it's like, oh my God, this is Franken food, right? And then you got to put a flavor in it. Then you have to bread it to make it taste like reimagined chicken, right? That you're going to pop into the microwave. And I started thinking about this. And that's why I came up with Beyond Impossible because Beyond Meat was there and Possible Burgers were there. It was all there, right? And I did a deep dive. I did a Zoe Horcomb. I went, okay. They're saying this is better for the environment. So I had to go down that that road. How is it better? Most of this stuff, the chemicals start somewhere in China. And then they have to be shipped here. We need dinosaur juice to get them here by either freight or flying it or whatever. Then we, you know, they had to manufacture it there. So something went into the atmosphere there. Some CO2 carbon went into the atmosphere there. And then we had to fly it here, more carbon into the atmosphere. And then we took the raw product here in the United States and we had to use more carbon and CO2 just to put it together as a fake burger. Okay. So I'm not sure if that's worse than a cow fart, but Frank <laughs> Mitlerner explained to me that it was way worse. And then, and I think I got Frederick Lacroix in there too, to explain. Oh, he's great. Yeah. Both of those are great. And then I went, okay, so we know it's not better for the environment because I've had two experts weigh in. Now let's look at the nutrition value, right? There's no way that you a man can make something that I, that we can get naturally from a cow. Mm -hmm. It's just it's just not possible. I went down those two roads. Now I called um I didn't call it. I wrote to Walter Willett. He turned me down. I wrote to Clapper. I wrote to um McDougal. I wrote to Gregor. Every one of them turned me down. Well, McDougal didn't just turn me down. He started berating my assistant. Oh. Yeah, just, he started sending hate emails to my assistant. It's not cool. Yeah. Um, Gregor said that he was busy that day, uh, although I didn't give him a date. <laughs> uh, will it said the same thing. I'm too busy to do this. And we said, we will accommodate you in any way, shape, or form. I just wanted to have a discourse. I didn't want to just have one side mm -hmm. talking about things. I wanted to have both sides talking and discussing. I wanted to do that documentary. I didn't want to do a vegan propaganda piece, mm -hmm. right? They always do a propaganda piece. I wanted both sides to explain. I wanted to get the truth out there, except they didn't want to come on and explain. Mm -hmm. I could not get one vegan doctor one of the overlords to come on and explain. Not one. What do you think's going on there? I think they know that they're on really shaky ground if they debated it. I would I would have no worries. So I got a presentation 
that's on open view on the net if you put my name in and you put should we be vegan um I don't know if I shared previously before it's not something I keep a secret of but like Nina I was vegetarian I was vegetarian for about 20 years most vegetarians lapse into veganism at some point either deliberately or accidentally and I think we we've both done that so um it's kind of like a smoker who doesn't smoke anymore I know I can do that presentation I understand why people go vegetarian so the best book on this is obviously the Lear Keith um, the vegetarian myth and and she absolutely nailed there are three reasons why people think you should be vegetarian they think it's better for your health they think it's better for your for the animals and they think it's better for the planet so in this half an hour presentation I go through the three of those um, as the poacher turned gamekeeper and it's it's not better for any of those so if somebody said to me I want you um, at a really important conference and I want you debating a vegan I'm confident that the science is on my side. The evidence is on my side. I'm not going to have to get emotional or upset or, what, or whatever. Um, you can rebut those three reasons for going vegetarian stroke vegan very easily. And I, I really wouldn't want to be on the other side trying to put together the argument from the plant-based side. Yeah. Oh, by the way, Lear Keith is in my third movie also. You really oh, okay. need to, I can't believe you haven't seen I it. I will. Yet. I've just made a note. I don't know if you saw me scribbling it down. I made a note. I, it did, will be... I did see you writing something out. I thought you were writing yeah. on Vic as a jerk. I'm never coming back. On this <laughs> no, I was writing down Beyond Impossible and I'll scribble other things as well. If you give me any other things I should watch or read. No, listen, you, you, you will be shocked. You know, you know, um, Lear's in the movie. Uh, you know, um, uh, Mitt Lerner, uh, uh, Lacroix. I, I go through a bunch of people because those are the guys that were willing to show up, right? Most people are not willing. And, and Zoe, I don't know if mm, this might have ended up. You see, whenever I do my documentaries, I can't remember what ends up on a cutting room floor or not because not everything makes it in. Um, but she says, I, I think I put this piece in a movie. Anytime you crack the ground, you're killing something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you because know, I couldn't lie anymore. I just yeah. couldn't tell that lie anymore. You know, yeah. and nobody was more of a staunch vegan than Lear Keith when she yeah. was a vegan. Yeah. You know, lived it to a T for like yeah. 30 years for and and completely screwed up her life. Yeah. Yeah. You know, she she's you know, parts of her body will never recover. Yeah. Did you know you were there for 20 years? So let me ask you, can I interview you about being a, a vegetarian? Go for it got nothing to hide um did you eat eggs or or fish or were you just straight vegetarian um, no so i i used to get really annoyed with that so if if you eat fish you're a pescatarian you're not a vegetarian so i used to be at a buffet and i say oh i'm vegetarian where's the vegetarian options and then somebody next to me would say oh i'm vegetarian too so i'm like oh great and then they say they eat fish and it's like fuck off you're not a vegetarian um so if you eat dairy and eggs you're a vegetarian if you don't eat dairy and eggs you're then vegan so yes i did eat dairy and eggs i wasn't so keen on eggs so my main kind of vegetarian animal food was was dairy um, and I liked milky lattes and that kind of thing. Um, and then I started um, dating a guy who I kind of just, I mean, I was so ignorant about nutrition back then. And I don't really care. Wait, sorry, sorry, sorry. What, what year was that? Give me okay, a year. Okay, so this... Um, so this would be in, um, in the 90s. Um, so, yeah, but early 90s. I'm dating this guy. I don't do the cooking. So if somebody puts some food in front of me, I'll eat it. And, you know, I'm happy as anything. He was, you know, quite interested in real food, but you soon realize being veggie is actually quite difficult. So um, I look back on what we were having now and it would be veggie burgers. Um, and then there was a whole period where he seemed to like veggie burgers, brown rice, brown burger buns and peas. And I look back now and that was vegan. And if I was really busy at work and I didn't get to get a latte, I wasn't even having milk. And I developed a couple of really nasty eye conditions. Um, and I ended up in Moorfields Eye Hospital, which is the, the, the absolute pinnacle eye hospital in the UK. This was in London. I ended up at this amazing eye hospital and they did loads of investigation. I was in such pain at times. I could hardly, to blink was like somebody put barbed wire 
in my eyes. And eventually these people said, oh, you've got something really unusual. It's called superior limbic carato conjunctivitis. We abbreviate it to SLK. And I said, well, what do I do? And they said, well, you can take these steroid eye drops. We'll see if they help. They didn't help. So it's like, okay, I ended up having a couple of eye operations, which I now realize were completely and utterly unnecessary And all that needed to happen was I needed to walk into that first person and the very first optician that I saw way before I got anywhere near Moorfields should have said, right, for something to change, something has changed. So what's changed? You don't wear glasses, so your glasses haven't changed. Let me think, have you changed your diet? And if they'd have then explored it a bit further, do you eat fish? No, I'm a vegetarian. How long have you been vegetarian? 20 years. So you haven't eaten fish for 20 years. It would not have been a difficult consultation for somebody to say to me, okay, you now have a choice. You can carry on with this ideology of being vegetarian and ruin your eyesight when you're in your 20s, or you can do something about it now, stop being vegetarian, start eating some fish, take some omega essential fats, get your dairy back in your diet, and ideally get some red meat in too, because you also need your zinc and your B vitamins and your iron and everything else. And that's the only conversation that I needed, but not one single person on my journey to try to understand what was going on ever asked me, what do you eat? Be the first thing I would ask if I were an optician. Did it take 20 years for your eyes to go bad? And so no, what did you it, start? It, it, and- it was really fast from when I slipped into veganism. So the so milk, I, I want a timeline because people are going to be interested in this. Right? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. So how old were you when you started vegetarianism? I so guess that I, was the- yeah, I would have been I would have been um teenager starting, so let's say around 15, 16, really trying to cut meat and fish and other things out of my diet. And at that time, quite honestly, I think it was because I was calorie counting. And you start, yeah, everyone was calorie counting as teenagers in in my era. Um, So you can Because, you know, this is interesting. And and were you doing it because you felt like you were fat? Because all young girls, no matter how thin they are, feel like they're fat. Yeah, 100%. So, yeah, so this this is now into the 80s when you're starting to get the dietary advice of you need to eat low fat and you need to eat um, more grains and all that kind of thing. So my mum was picking up on that. So things in the cupboards at home were changing, but you're right. Every teenage girl, it doesn't matter what size she is. I was incredibly sporty. So I was playing hockey, tennis, rounders, athletics, swimming. I was a qualified lifeguard at 15. Um, I could swim five miles when I was 10. You know, I've got the shoulders from somewhere. (laughs) I was really, really sporty. So I was, um, I was strong. I mean, I was never more than half a stone, maybe overweight as a teenager. Seven um, pounds. Folks. Yeah, but yeah, seven pounds. Sorry. Yeah. But you, you, th- it was on my face because, you know, you have bigger cheeks when you're younger. Um, you know, it's well, on you're, your looking at Christy, you're looking at Christy Brinkley and uh, Twiggy and you're going, yeah. wait, I don't look like those women who are yeah. skeletors. And you're a perfectly normal sized girl. You're an athlete. By the way, folks, rounders is baseball. We changed it. In this <laughs> and a stone is 14 pounds. I'll, I'll translate. <laughs> I'm married to one of them. Sorry, um, I'll, I'll remember that. I normally do on American things. I forgot. Yeah, very yeah. good. So, um, but you're perfectly, you're an athlete. You're playing all these sports. You can swim. You're like Nyad. You can swim five yeah. miles. Did you ever swim the channel or anything? Because that's no, no, no. Because I, I wouldn't do. I mean, I, <laughs> I was going to say I wouldn't do cold water, but I did. I really got to quite a high level as a lifeguard. So I did. I was a qualified student lifeguard teacher when I was about sixteen, and I did open water. So we had to go to a sort of lake in the in the UK in the middle of winter. It was horrific. Oh. Um, and and the test is that they put some poor sod in the middle of this lake. And they're wearing a wetsuit. But the test is you've got to imagine that you're walking by the towpath with your dog and you see that someone has, has got into difficulty in the water and you go out and rescue them. So um, it's how many of your clothes do you take off before you get in? How fast you get in? How safely do you get in? All of that kind of stuff. So anyway, that's that's me as a teenager. Um, throughout Cambridge, I was avoiding um, meat and fish mid twenties is when I then met this guy and suddenly lapsed into veganism. And I'd say it was within weeks, not even months of lapsing into veganism that um, 
my eyes were really starting to be failing but it wasn't just my eyes you know I look back then and I'm a really confident person and I'm I, I love presenting um you know I'm really happy if I'm up at a conference and there's an audience that's kind of my energy feeds off that and I can remember being at work and we were doing um not even presenting at a conference you just like it was your turn at the team meeting to say right what's happening in your um department at the moment and update people and I was having panic attacks and it's like well what is this this is this is insane I mean my whole nutrient base was just massively affected mentally physically and emotionally within just a few weeks now I can't even remember what it wasn't some great person at Moorfields who got me out of this I'm, I, I can't even remember what got me out I didn't kind of wake up and go oh I've lapsed into veganism. You know, I must have just found some way of getting dairy back into my diary, uh, into my diet. And then it wasn't until 2010 when I went to a Western Price conference and I heard Barry Groves talking and he was talking about the evolutionary diet and how we'd evolved to eat meat. And then I heard Sally Fallon Morrell talking. And that was the first time in my whole life I ever realized that vitamin A came in two forms. And of course, vitamin A, the animal form is what the body needs, which is retinol, retinol, think retina of the eye. And I was just sat there at this conference and I just went, oh, my goodness, that's why I had that weird SLK disease. And then I was messaging my by then husband, Andy, under the table saying, right, I'm coming back from this conference, not veggie anymore. And he's like, what? I'm getting the steak in. Um, and I've been mostly animal foods. The, the, the most calories in my diet come from meat, fish, eggs, dairy, um, green things, whatever. But it's it's mostly animal foods now. And it just feels so much better. So it, you don't have to be the air Keith. You don't have to get to the point where you can't walk and you've got spine curvature and you will have permanent health problems. These things can come on really rapidly. And if you don't, stop them and I guess I just got lucky actually I seem to remember there was a um because I was head of HR at this point I was HR director and I remember somebody coming in to say um we could get like a coffee stall in the canteen and your employees would love it and they'd be really happy and it would stop them going outside to get coffee and it was great coffee and I remember thinking what a great idea and sure enough it was really popular like I was the best HR director you know getting this this coffee thing in but of course it got me back having lattes so it didn't really matter what I was getting at home. I was I was getting a lot of milk and I still drink a lot of milk now. And I know all the vegans are like, oh, you're drinking baby food for cows or whatever. It's like, I'm drinking milk. Look at the nutritional profile in milk and then tell me I'm not supposed to eat it. If I'm not supposed to consume it, how come it's got just about everything in it that I could possibly need? Oh, you, you can survive on dairy. You know, yeah. I tell it a lot of time you can survive if you had to. I'm not yeah. saying survive on that. Don't go on a strictly dairy diet, folks. Yeah. But um, I want to get into another doctor I spoke to. But first, I need to tell folks about Villa Capelli olive oil. Well, I bet you Dr. Horcomb loves olive oil. Do you do you like olive oil, Zoe? I know yeah, I should no, say that because it's no, so no, you don't have to say it. You, you're not an olive oil fan. It's the only um, fruit juice I approve of. Yeah, if if there's any cooking that goes on. So if you're doing a stir fry, then yeah, olive oil. And then you have a nice super salad, yeah, olive oil and balsamic vinegar. Um, but I'm not I'm not kind of one of these people that say you've got to have X tablespoons a day or something. It's just oh, I, I drink it. I, I literally drink it. I drink an oh, ounce wow, okay. of if I and that's including what Serena puts in the veggies and everything else, I will drink an ounce of olive oil. People always say to me, besides your own supplements, what else do you take? And it's olive oil. But nothing makes me feel better than olive oil. So I like a high fat diet, olive oil, folks, Villa Capelli. In this country, you're able to cut olive oil up to 40% and still call it 100% pure olive oil. There are other brands out there that sell pure olive oil. I just can't go out and study them all. If you want to go study them, go check out the UC Davis olive oil study or read the book Extra Virginity, <clears throat> or, or you can support this show and get the best tasting olive oil on the planet right out of Puglia, right near where my people came from, Puglia, Italy. Go check it out. Villa Capelli olive oil, save 10% by putting in promo code Vinny. 
V-I-N-N-I-E, 10% every single time, not just the first time. Go check out Villa Capelli Olive Oil. Uh, while I'm at it and doing ads, I'm going to remind people, <clears throat> if it's, if this show comes out before the 30th of this month, and I think it is, go to VinnyTauteries.com forward slash VIP and put your name in because we're going to start that twice a month check-in group. You want to be part of that. We opened it up last Monday with Anna Vocino. We talked about it. And several hundred people have already put their names in. Don't miss out. Go check out vinnytotaris.com forward slash VIP. We're going to do a twice a month check-in. It's going to be every month so that you can stay on track. People have been asking me to do something like this for a long time. I've gone, nah, I got too much going on. But you know what? I like talking to people. I'm going to do it. And uh, go check that out. VinnyTotteries.com forward slash VIP. We're talking to Dr. Zoe Harcone. By the way, she's got some great books out there. Just go Google it. It's in the Vinny Book Club. All of her books are in the Vinny Book Club over at, um, you know, because I'm an influencer on Amazon. So you guys can just go to VinnyTotteries.com. Click on that Amazon link. You'll see all of the stuff I talk about. Check out the Vinny Book Club. Zoe's books are in there. Zoe, you were talking about veganism falling you know i love how you say that you lapsed into it because <laughs> it's kind of like yeah i used to smoke pot and then before you know it <laughs> going to the heroin and your teeth are falling out it's not dissimilar because uh dr ann childers i don't know if you know who ann is i do uh, i do yeah i've met ann at a conference in south africa isn't she amazing i mean I she, her. this woman her teeth were falling but where she was having problems with her teeth her hair was falling out and she couldn't remember. She here's a doctor who had to hire an assistant because she couldn't remember what dishes went where in her own cabinets. And this woman's a doctor. Mm -hmm. She's working with patients every day, yet her eyesight is failing, her hair is falling out, she's having dental problems, and she can't remember anything. She thought she was going into early dementia, and then one day she had a piece of meat. Is that pretty much the story? I mean, yeah, we yeah. hear this all the time. Yeah. Right. Lyra Keith can never have kids. Mm -hmm. I mean, she's too old for it now, but at the time she, she couldn't understand why she could never have kids. She didn't have a period. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, this kind of stuff goes on and, you know, we got people like Walter Willard going, Hey, let's double down on this. What's the end game for these guys other than money? Is it just strict money? Or can you see any other end game? I think it's it's money. I, th I mean, it's always money and power, isn't it? It's um, it's either incompetence, and these guys are not incompetent, um, or it's 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 money and power. And I actually think it's control of the food supply, because everything that they want us to eat is made by companies, big big food companies, and it's made in factories. And this whole demonization of the animals. Um, so the third reason why people go vegetarian because they think it's better for the planet why is that just utterly completely wrong because the most important role that ruminants play which is your cow sheep goats deer is that they graze they're supposed to graze on the land they're not supposed to be in concrete sheds and fed stuff that's made in the amazon when you chop down some trees that's disastrous they're supposed to be grazing on the land as they do by and large in certainly where i live in wales and also in england and in doing so, they have this incredible four stomach system and they're eating the grass and all the bugs and they're hosting them with a microflora and they're regurgitating them. And that is what protects our topsoil. Now, our topsoil used to be several feet thick. And in many parts of the world at the moment, it's either completely disappeared where we've got desertification or it's just a few millimeters thick. But we are massively reducing the topsoil in the world. Without topsoil, we can't grow food naturally. And I don't just mean we can't have grazing animals, we can't grow crops. We can't grow all the plants that the plant-based people want us to live, but they're already growing food upside down in greenhouses. So if you Google food being grown or greenhouses on the landscape, um, I forget the, the word for it, um, something in a tray or whatever, but it, they're growing food upside down in greenhouses without topsoil. And the minute you do that, it's game over for feeding the planet naturally. And you can only conclude that there must be some psychopaths somewhere in, in this whole drive to make this happen because it is the complete destruction of the, of the planet's ability 
to feed the population on the planet. It is that serious. It's not, you know, this is like stuff of Bond movies. And nobody seems to realise that if the world went vegan, if it went where Walter Willett would like it to go, that is the end game for producing food naturally on this planet. And then we are all completely beholden to the Monsantos, the Cargills, the big agri-chemical companies, the big food companies, Nabisco Craft, Mars, et cetera, et cetera. We're all beholden to them because that's where all of our food will come from. There'll be no other alternative. Yeah, it's really sad. But I really want you to watch my movie now because we go into that a little bit without, I go just shy of putting on a tinfoil hat by thinking- <laughs> It's not too foil to me. That's really not. But, this is uh, where we're headed. But, 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 but when we start talking about there's one person controlling everything, people think guys like you and me need a tinfoil hat. I don't think there's one person, but I think I think there is a concerted movement at the moment of which Walter Willett is a part, and of which um, if you're making fake food, you're quite happy if if farmers don't end up making any food at all. Um, what's happening with the Dutch farmers at the moment where they're trying to mess up their access to fertilizers um, and so on. There's there's some sinister things happening with our food production at the moment. And I don't know all the, the players, but I just know the ones I trust in all of this are the farmers. And those are the ones who are getting a pretty raw deal globally at the moment. As uh, I've told people, you know, friends in private conversations, they'll go, well, aren't you worried about meat? And I said, no. Not as long as I could get a hold to uh, nitrogen, I'll be fine. I was like, well, what are you talking about? Well, you know, I can make I can make ammunition, and I can still shoot animals. And if for some reason I can't get the powder to make ammunition, I have I have archery equipment. I will never go hungry. I'm not worried about me. I'm worried about my my relatives, mm -hmm. my brothers my nephews, my niece, I'm, I'm worried about the future, my my stepdaughter, you know, they they're all living in this world, we're going to be gone. Mm -hmm. I know I'm going to be fine. You're going to be fine. We're going to make it. We're going to make it and die. We're going to still be eating meat. Mm -hmm. But I'm worried about what's happening behind us. Right. And I don't want to see those people suffer. Mm -hmm. I have deer roaming in my backyard, I can get I, I'm pointing to an actual recurved bow right there. I don't even need a compound bow. I'm old school. I can take one out in my backyard right now, <laughs> skin it in the shed, and I'll be eating meat. Right? No problem. I hunt. We talked about that before the mics went hot. I hunt. As long as I can get a shotgun shell, I can bring a bird down. Right? I'm fine. Serena's fine. We're good. But I'm really worried about, and now I sound like, like, um, what's her name? How dare you, girl? Um, that poor kid. <laughs> what's Greta. her name? Greta. Greta. Oh, yeah, dang. you know, I, I feel, you know what? People say, what about that Greta Thunberg? It's like, you know what? I hate her parents for putting this kid up to this. Yeah. This kid has some sort of learning ability. Yeah. That's very obvious, yeah. right? This woman, this kid needs help. Greta needs help. But what do we do? We put her in front of people and turn her into a, a dancing monkey. Mm -hmm. And I'm not good with that. Right? I'm not good with that. That That's where you go on vegans? You mm -hmm. go on with that? Put a kid on a sailboat and drive her in front of a bunch of uh, men and go, how dare you? Mm -hmm. that, that's what we're doing? That's, that's your mascot? a young woman that needs help. Mm. I, I wasn't good with that from the beginning. It's like, how dare you do that to this kid? Yeah. You know, but I, I'm the only one thinking like that. Everyone else wants to goof on her. It's not her fault. She doesn't know what's going on. She's just reciting some script. Mm -hmm. Some idiot parents handed her on a sailboat. You know, it, it drives me crazy. I guess that's why we're here, for me to be driven crazy. <laughs> so what else are we learning from your research, Zoe? You you do you do a paper every week. What makes you decide on the paper? How do you figure out what you want to do next? Yeah, I, I get a lot sent in to me. Um, so I obviously look at a lot of academic journals, look at what's coming out. I get a lot sent in. So actually now... I've got so many topics, I probably get 10 to 20 that come in every week. So I'll look at 
um, one that's very different to ones that I've done recently. So if there was another one on red meat and diabetes in four weeks time, I wouldn't cover it because we've done it. I've done it absolutely um, in detail. So if, if I would ever get bored reading them, I'm not going to do them because um, if I get bored doing it, then somebody's going to get bored reading it. So I really will go from um, I looked at one recently where I looked at um, do you suffer more heart disease if you try to take hormone therapy because you'd like to change your sex so um that's pretty different to red meat and diabetes and then um as I say there's one I'm looking at on brisk walking um there was a great one I did this week actually a friend of mine has done a great study for her PhD and most dietary interventions they take people on the standard diet and then they give them an intervention so Isabella did this brilliant thing where she took 10 young women on and women are never studied which is why it was also a really brave study 10 young women who had been following a ketogenic diet for about four years and were well in ketosis you know all their sort of bhb levels were were well into ketosis and then she knocked them out of ketosis for 21 days and said follow the standard uk diet which is pretty much the same as the standard american diet it's really high in grains fruit, vegetables, you're allowed a little bit of junk because, you know, you'd be better have junk, um, really low on meat, really low on fat, uh, really high on carbohydrate. And she then measured markers of metabolic health and aging. And of course, even in 21 days, glucose went up, insulin went up, BMI went up, weight went up, fat mass went up, water went up. Um, it was just astounding how much you could harm these healthy average age of 30 young women in 21 days and then the third phase of the trial was you put them back in ketosis and their markers kind of went back to where they were in, in when they were sort of in phase one which is their normal keto phase um, so these these women recovered really quickly not everyone will um, you know, I, I wouldn't want your clients to then think, oh, great, I could go off for 21 days between Thanksgiving and Christmas and everything's going to be fine. Uh -uh. If you're if you're not young, metabolically healthy, um, slim, BMI averaging 20.5, been in ketosis for four years, you're not going to get away with that kind of a de departure. Um, so it was such a great study. It, it, it told us so many things in just this one really well executed dietary trial so that that's the kind of thing that i'll write about so um some things will just be trials that people haven't heard about some will be like the, the red meat and diabetes that's the real um sort of classic of what i'll do when everybody's writing into you saying i've seen the headlines my plant-based friends are beating me up over it or my mother-in-law's beating me up over it because i keep giving my husband red meat for dinner you know please give me the ammunition to fight back against this so it's like you know okay here's the here's the the flaws in every epidemiological study we've done the food frequency questionnaire you've then got you can only ever show association you can't show causation you've then got the fact that they screen relative risk they'll say oh you're 60 percent more likely to get diabetes and then when you boil it down it's like okay so you had a one in a thousand chance 60% higher is a 1.6 in a thousand chance, you know, do you care? Right. Um, even if it were causal and it isn't, you know, see the association point. And then of course you always have this healthy person confounder. So the first thing you should say is, well, what, if they're talking about red meat, particularly in the U S um, what do you guys eat for red meat in, in the U S you eat burgers and you eat hot dogs. Um, right. that, that's, that's mainly what you're eating. So what do you eat with those burgers and hot dogs? Do you eat a bun? Do you eat French fries? Do you eat a fizzy drink or a milkshake or some ice cream or something? They didn't measure any of that. You know, they, they didn't say, oh, actually, I'm sure it wasn't the red meat in the burger. I'm sure it was all the carbohydrates that came alongside with the burger. Um, so they, they just always damn red meat when actually what they really should be damning is carbohydrate. But then on top with this study, um, you know, we, we've done one, which is the calorie intake was just absurd. In the characteristics table, which is the first one you look at when you're going to take a population paper apart, I looked at what they claimed were the average portions for women and for men. And they were claiming that women consume more red meat than men. Even these, these nurses consuming 1,200 calories a day, they were having twice the portion size at the lower end of men on a daily basis. It's like that's never happened. That You know, again... Oh. 
Your calorie intake tells you your study is, is wrong. Your portion size for women tells you your study is wrong. There was a, oh yeah, they said the risk for the, the hazard ratio for total meat was higher than the hazard ratio for processed meat and the hazard ratio for unprocessed meat. It's like, no, the hazard ratio for total meat is always in between the other two because processed meat raises it and unprocessed meat alleviates it. So it's always in between the two. It's, it's like saying um, I'm five foot two and you're probably, I don't know, six foot and a hundred or something. And yet our average height is actually higher than you. It's like, right. no, our, our but, average... But, 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 our average has to be in between the two of us. It can't be higher than the and the, the highest one. It's just insane. It's like, how can you, how did you not sense check that? How did the peer reviewers not spot that and say, that's insane? There were there were like half a dozen showstoppers on this paper to say, that is wrong. That just has to be wrong. You've got to go back to the drawing board because you've called black white there. It's just wrong. There's no other way of saying it. And and that's what I do every week. And and clearly, I'm still passionate about it. Um, but can, can we, wait, Zoe? Can can we now assume at least that the the people reviewing are just as compromised as the Walter Willits of the world? I mean, when Walter sends something to be peer reviewed, he's going to send it to where he knows he's going to get a favorable trial, right? One hundred percent. And the journal also knows they want to publish the paper because they know it's going to get press release. They know it's going to make headlines around the world. They know it's going to raise the impact factor of the journal. Um, so the minute Harvard come forward with one of these papers, the journals are falling over themselves. So they always end up in the really good journals like um, the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, the New England Medical Journal, the BMJ, the Lancet. They end up in the best ones, which get the best impact factors. Um, and no peer reviewer is going to challenge one of these. It can be, oh, my goodness, it's Harvard. You know, there's no way I'm going to be able to spot that Harvard got something wrong. Um, yeah, give it to me. Every every Harvard study, every Harvard population study I've ever looked at, there's something wrong. So let me peer review it. But they won't, of course. I've written to him, by the way. I've written to Wallet. It was hilarious. So he's Walter Willett, not Wallet. And he's the corresponding author on this paper. So quite often I do my Monday note and then... Even though I know it's just such a waste of time, I get the corresponding author and I'll write to them and say, hey, please, can you help me understand? I phrase it really nicely. Can you help me understand how women ended up eating more than men and how total meat ended up being higher hazard ratio and how you thought a calorie intake of 1200 was accurate, let alone good for a baseline? Da, 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 da. So I write all of this to him. He's the corresponding author. And I get this email back. I should forward it on to you. And it basically says, I'm so busy. What are you writing to me for? Um, I'll, it, the people I reply to are kind of my students and other people in the faculty. And you really should think twice about emailing people. <laughs> and I'm like, you're the corresponding author. You don't have to send me that email. That's the email I got from him when I tried to get him in a movie that got wide release around the world. There you go. Like, hey, my movies go through Gravitas Ventures. They end up on 70 VODs around the world. They end up on Amazon. They're on, uh, you name it, Vimeo. They're, I, my movies are everywhere except Netflix and Hulu, which I refuse to sell to. Good on you. And people say, why do you make a lot more money if you sold to them? Yes, I would. But if, if you sell it to Netflix, it's now a Netflix property. No one else can see it. And if there's one vegan at Netflix that wants to bury this, mm -hmm. they can give me $2 million and bury it. It doesn't matter anything to them. They'll just bury it. Yeah. So my deal with Gravitas, every time that they're the distribution company, whenever I go to Gravitas Ventures, it's written in my contract. We're not selling this to Hulu. There's more than Hulu and Netflix. There's about 10 of them. I will not sell to. Mm -hmm. It's like I want it to be everywhere else around the world where it's going to be seen except these because it could get buried, right? Now, if if Netflix wants to come and buy Fatter Documentary, the, the poster behind me, they want to buy that now five, six years down the road and put it on, knock yourself out because it's everywhere else. It's been on every airline around the world, right? I'm good. I'm good. Now you can hand me a check. But before that, not going to happen, right? And when you mentioned Walter Will, it's like, yeah, you write to him. And it's like, yeah, no, no, I don't have time for you. Mm. I'm too important. Yeah, That's it, what he's it, basically saying. Yeah, it, it makes me wonder how, you know, 
Nina and I sat here in this very house and got drunk one night. Uh, I won't say Nina got drunk. Maybe I had too many drinks. And I was looking at two Ninas. <laughs> That'd be nice. Went. I'd like two Ninas. We need two Ninas in the world. Yeah, we and do. Nina and I were sitting here having a, a, a drink, and we were talking about it's like, well, we're doing all of this stuff. Is it actually, does it matter? Does it matter? I mean, are we doing anything that's going to get anywhere? Right? Because sometimes it feels like we're just hitting a brick wall. We're just being, beating our head into a brick wall. Do, do you ever feel that way? Or do you ever feel like we're getting anywhere? I've given up thinking that public health guidelines are going to change, um, which I know is, has been the thing that Nina has really, really tried to do. Um, yeah. So for me, it's about the bottom up revolution. And it's about people working it out for themselves. And then, as you say, somebody sees that guy, Scott, and he's lost 300 pounds. How did you do it? It wasn't the bariatric surgery. It was um, following what Vinny recommends. And then a couple of other people follow what he's doing and then they do really well. And it, that that's how it's going to spread. And it's really annoying because it's so much slower than if the government owned up and said, guys, we got it wrong. You should have been basing your meals on animal foods, not on these beige things. And that's why we've now got obesity and diabetes. So we were wrong. But they will never do that because we could all sue them and say, you gave me obesity. You gave me type 2 diabetes. You gave me bowel cancer or whatever. So they, they'll never admit that. So I've kind of given up there. Whether well, look, Nina has, I don't know. Guys like me, you know, I get throttled. On, on the internet, you know, they, they took me off of Wikipedia, one vegan, one person was able to take me down. There was not one thing that wasn't factual about me on Wikipedia. They took me off the same day that they took uh, Malcolm Kendrick off. Mm. We both disappeared on the same day, about three or four years ago. Mm. Um, YouTube, they're now we're being throttled on YouTube. Wow. Right? We're being cut back on YouTube. Um, uh, Twitter, even though it was taken over and it's called X now, we I, I've had experts look at mine and say, this makes no sense. Mm -hmm. This makes no sense. There's still people in those organizations who are throttling guys like me back. Instagram, for the past three months, I've been losing 300 people a day, 300 people a day consistently. They've been I, I've had like, uh, I don't know, 4000 people. I'm down to like 94,000 people on Instagram, they keep taking them away. Right? As many people as come on every day, they take more than that away. If I get 500 people a day, they take three, you know, 300 other people, I'm not gaining. Hmm. I'm not gaining. So when they start doing that, then you go, well, we're shot. I don't think Nina's given up. I haven't given up. I keep waking, waiting for some breakthrough. And people are saying, Oh, go on to this site, go on to that platform go do all this stuff right yeah we could do all that but what they're going to come and throttle that mm. you know so why I haven't, I haven't given up don't you know clearly I, i'm working at the bottom up revolution i'm being realistic in that if you said to me do you think they will change the dietary guidelines to what we advise during my lifetime i'd say no i don't think they will doesn't mean no. i'm not going to stop trying it doesn't mean i'm not going to stop speaking at conferences and doing my Monday note and putting things out on Twitter and on the internet and trying to, I say to people, I don't care what you eat, but I care that you know what you should eat. That That's what I want for people. When when you know yeah. what you should eat and it's not what the government tells you you should eat, it's up to you, you're a grown up. Um, if, if you wanna eat French fries all day long and suffer the consequences, that's your call. But you should at least know what you should eat. You know, that's, I agree with you, but I think you and me were being a bit Pollyanna about this because when I talk to the to the yard guy who's got a you know three kids at home and he goes, Yeah, Vin, you're telling me I should eat meat. I don't have that kind of money because you know they're making it so out of sight for people now mm -hmm. that they can't do it, right? The guy goes, Look, I could fill my my family up on on rice. I can fill my family up on pasta. I can fill my family up on beans. I can't afford meat. You know, so it's not just about people like you and me going, hey, you got to make a decision. That decision is made for a lot of people, mm -hmm. which is part of what I worry about. 
with the ground up approach. Yeah, I think you're right. Ground up is the only way we can do it. But within that, the average person, and I'm always worried about the middle class because I grew up so middle class that you couldn't even see straight, <laughs> right? I knew what it looked like to be poor and I was close enough to see kids that had money. We were right in the middle, right? I've always strived to be wealthier so that I can afford some of the nicer things. Now the nicer things are things like meat, mm -hmm. right? I but see what it costs at a grocery store. It ain't but cheap. There are, no, but there are cheaper options. I mean, we we get this kickback as well. Um, hmm. it, it doesn't have to be sea bass or whatever. I mean, there's tinned fish. Mints is actually quite cheap. And interestingly, certainly where we live, the fattier mints is cheaper because everybody wants the lean mints. So if, yeah. if you're looking at the more unusual cuts, if you're looking at skirt of beef or um, rolled rib of pork or whatever, whatever, instead of pork chops or steak, there are cheaper options. Um, and I hate to say it as well, but I've had this debate with people and I say to them, do you have Netflix? Yeah. Do you have Sky TV? Yeah. It's like, well, I don't. So maybe we just have different priorities um, and that's right. fine. I'm not judging, but I would always rather spend money on my food than I would on entertainment, eating out, buying a burger, delivery, going to the cinema, um, definitely, I would never spend money on cigarettes or alcohol as ahead of spending money on meat and fish or whatever. Um, so a lot of people say, oh, you know, I can't afford that. But they they are subscribing to all these channels of just getting fed entertainment on a on a regular basis or whatever. Well, you sound like uh, Serena and me because we we live pretty frugally you know, we're empty nesters. We've done OK for ourselves. We still shop. I shop at three different butchers. Mm. And people go, why three different butchers? Because they all have sales on different mm. days. Yeah. Right. You know, you'll see a New York strip, it'll be $18 a pound, and you'll go back the next day and it's $7 a pound. Well, guess what? Mm. I'm going to eat the $7 a pound version. Yeah. Right. It's the same piece of meat just one day later because we know where to shop. Mm. And when you do that kind of thing, you can eat steak more often. Mm -hmm. Ground beef. I mean, mm -hmm. come on. Ground beef is literally cheaper than my dog's food. We've done the math. We could actually feed my dog ground beef every day for cheaper than the dog food we buy. And you most should. people don't realize that. Oh, we, we mix it in. Yeah. We, any kind of leftover anything, any kind of meat goes in that dog food to lessen the amount of dog food we have to put in. It's cheaper that way. Yeah. There are ways to do it. But you see, we both grew up, you know, middle class, lower middle class. So both Serena and I both, we we grew up in a situation where we had to figure out how to make do to get what we wanted. Mm -hmm. And here we are 60 something years old, and we're still doing it. Mm -hmm. We haven't changed that. Right? And we probably never will. I can't imagine we will. Mm -hmm. Right? But when you tell that to people, they'll go, well, you know, yeah, you're right. Netflix is that and the other thing. And you'll see the car they're driving and they got a mortgage. I call them mortgages. <laughs> on the There's car. a mortgage on the car. Yeah. Right. Which is beyond me. Yeah. And I've had mortgages on cars when I was younger because I couldn't afford to buy it outright. Mm. Right. But after it was paid for, I kept it forever. Mm. Right. I didn't go get another mortgage. Yeah. And then eventually... It, it's so money is such a weird thing. You see, I've always wanted to do a money podcast, but Dave Ramsey already does it. People always say to me, Oh, you're hoity toity, you buy cars for cash. Yes, I do. How do you do that? Well, once you've paid off the car you had to pay off, keep putting that same amount yeah. of money in the bank yeah. for the next four or five years. Mm -hmm. So when you absolutely need another car you have the money to walk in and hand them cash. Mm. Now you're only buying one thing, you're buying a car. Because when you take a mortgage out, you're buying two things, you're buying a car and you're buying money, mm -hmm. which is the stupidest thing we do yeah. as humans. We buy money and it ain't cheap. We think, oh, we gotta pay it back, it's just a small percentage. No, you're paying for that, mm. paying for that privilege. And there's ways to work around that. And a guy like me who was making a regular wage most of his life figured out that. 
once you finish paying that mortgage the next month, if you were paying 400 a month, put 400 in the checking account every month. Mm -hmm. In three years, you're going to have, and, and by the way, you put it in, in, a, in an account where it's going to, you know, compound interest and mm -hmm. you have more than you need. Mm -hmm. But I didn't mean to go off on a money tangent. It, but isn't it part, part and parcel of what we're talking about here today, right? Where there's a will, there's a way. Yeah. Let's tell them where they can find you, Zoe. Uh, the ZoeHarcom.com. Harcom is spelled H-A-R-C-O-M-B-E. There's an E on the end, Harcom. dot com. Zoe, spelled the normal way, Z-O-E-H-A-R-C-O-M-B-E dot com. Go check it out because every Monday she puts out something very special. She also has a couple of books. I've read them and I can't remember the exact title. Sorry, can you throw the names of the titles out? Yeah, so um, the first one I wrote was called Why Do You Overeat When All You Want Is To Be Slim? And then I wrote one called Stop Counting Calories and Start Losing Weight. And then I wrote one, The Obesity Epidemic, What Caused It and How Can We Stop It? And then there's a couple of others. There's quite a few recipe books because people always want recipes, like people can't get enough recipes. And then there's yeah. a little book for men, which is so thin, because whenever I showed men the stop counting calories book or whatever they kind of look at it and go well i'm never going to read that so we did one for men that you can read in sort of 30 minutes so they know what to do i love that you said we have one for men and you held your fingers like this. <laughs> oh, here we go um <laughs> folks i mentioned it during the show i'm going to mention it again because everyone wants to know this vinnytauteries.com slash vip get on that list we will be sending something out on the 30th of this month so that you guys can sign up for the um, the uh, twice a month check-in that we're doing. And there's going to be stuff. Yeah, I'm going to hand out freebies and all kinds of stuff. I'm really into this. It's something I've been wanting to do for a long time. We're going to do it. Also, before you go to Amazon, go to VinnyTotteries.com. Click through the banner. Put the coal on the fire. gets my train down the track. You can find all of Zoe's books in the Vinny Totterich Book Club on my Amazon page. So on behalf of Dr. Zoe Harcomb, my name is Vinnie Totterich. Put life into living and do it with enthusiasm. <laughs>